There's a trade in crypto that everybody seems to be missing. It is Bitcoin mining stocks. But some people have been yelling from the rooftops that this is where you should be deploying your capital if you want to take advantage of all Bitcoin has to offer in the next cycle. One of those people, maybe the most vocal, is Mike Alfred. He's actually been on this show talking about it before. But today we're really going to break down the case for Bitcoin miners and Bitcoin mining stocks. Of course, I've got Texas West Capital on the back end of the stream. You guys don't want to miss this one. Let's go. Let's go. What is up, everybody? I'm Scott Melker, also known as the Wolf of All Streets. Before we get started, please subscribe to the channel and hit that like button. You'll notice that we didn't do the countdown today. I got a very uh, scolding lesson from some fellow YouTubers that said, you have to talk about what the title is of the video in the first seven seconds. And if you do a 10 second countdown, you're breaking the algorithm. So maybe I'll get like four more people to watch this and like it today as a result of getting rid of the 10 second countdown but guys like right now in this market is crazy everybody wants to share a video with you about what altcoin is going to go 100x next and why you need to buy something and sell something and do something i'm american i can't do that but what we can do is talk about the value of certain sectors that people may be missing and do a really deep dive here now everybody knows that today's guest mike alfred is deep into uh, bitcoin mining sits on the board of certain companies. I'm going to bring him on right now, and we're going to talk about why mining stocks may be the real opportunity of the next cycle. Good morning, sir. Good How morning, are you Scott. today? Feels like we're old friends now. I, well, we've actually done this in person, too. You know, people people don't know, but we've actually met. We, we met at Michael Saylor's house uh, over some barbecue, fresh off the grill, I think. You, That's myself, and, and Emmy sat down at a table didn't know each other, and uh, there, there it was. Beginning it's of a, something beautiful. It's a hell of a name, hell of a name drop there. <laughs> we met. Yeah, then, uh, well, okay, so if we're gonna name drop, I, I met you at Michael Saylor's house, and then that night I showed up at a party uh, for Gemini with the Winklevoss that's, twin that's on a, in a mansion at Star Island, and there you were at like one thirty in the morning, uh, hanging out well, with I think it was Robert Breedlove and Mark Moss. And all you know, guys. you know, I had to sne- you had to sneak into that. Uh, Le- Leah Halpern and Mark Moss basically snuck me in they convinced the guards to let me in but i did not have an invitation to that i also did not have an invitation and just had a very large man with me uh who knew how to talk his way into things so that my, my friend adam who, who gets me into literally anything anyways though so here we are let's talk let, let's talk about the title at hand right alert buy bitcoin mining stocks you and i've been having this conversation i actually started buying some very happy that i did um but Maybe lay out the base case here. They've been somewhat lagging. Why is this where you might want to deploy some capital uh, coming into the next cycle? So first off, I, I got to give two caveats. Um, you know, the, the first one is nothing that I say about any of these companies is an advertisement or an inducement or doesn't constitute, uh, you know, uh, uh, any sort of advice. advice. Yeah, to, to because... You know, obviously, I sit on the board of Iris Energy, the ticker's IREN. I love the company, but I can't recommend uh, directly that you buy it as much as I think it's a, a wonderful valuation. And then the second thing I'd say is that for most people across a full cycle, you will do better uh, than than buying Bitcoin mining stocks by just buying Bitcoin because Bitcoin doesn't have dilution. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't have a cap table. Bitcoin doesn't have a management team with stock options. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't have facilities that can go down. It doesn't have municipalities that can sue them or tax them higher. It doesn't have a power company, uh, you know, that can charge them higher rates on power. So, just keep that in mind. Um, these assets are quite volatile. They're they're quite risky. Um, I think if you do it right, you can make a lot of money and you could potentially beat Bitcoin over various periods. But it's not something that I recommend. So, with with all that as a caveat, Scott, I, I'm happy to give you some thoughts on why I, I like the sector. Yeah, I want to know why you like the sector, and then I want to dig into how you actually differentiate between these companies, because there's quite a few of them that are publicly listed that people can trade. Sure. So keep in mind that this is a nascent industry in a sense. Like the industrial scale miners didn't really exist five, seven, nine years ago, right? So like what we're talking about, if you talk to like the largest firms like Marathon and Riot and CleanSpark and Iris and Cypher, they'll all tell you like there's still stuff they're doing that's like a startup. So I kind of like that because it reminds me of the internet data center business. 
uh, back in the early 2000s, where if you really saw what was coming with the internet, you realize that you need a tremendous amount of infrastructure to support the growth in the consumer internet. Because keep in mind, back in 2000, I don't think most people thought their primary method of communication, the primary way they would buy things, the primary way they, they would operate their business is via the internet. And so the internet data center business back then was quite small. Um, but if you bought those stocks back then and held them till today, you made in some cases 200, 300, 400 X. I think the mining business is somewhat similar. The, the caveat there again is that the revenue, the top line gets cut in half by the halving every year. And so what you have to see over time is increases in the Bitcoin price or increases in the, in the transaction fees. And uh, historically, we've seen both. Um, and so across a full cycle, Bitcoin mining equity acts as sort of levered exposure to Bitcoin via the operating leverage from the business itself. And the way that works is quite simple. Like, let's say you set up a Bitcoin mining operation with 5x a hash of capacity, right? So you've got a significant amount. Let's say it's 1% of the global hash rate. And your power price is 2.5 cents or 3 cents per kilowatt hour, which is quite good. That's industrial scale. There are very few people that have that type of power. And it's fixed. Your cost all in for Bitcoin from an electricity standpoint might be hypothetically, let's say 15,000. And so at, at a 25 or $30,000 price, the market's not going to be too excited about your equity. But at a 60 or $80,000 Bitcoin price, again, assuming your, your electricity cost doesn't move from 15,000, you start to see increasing amount, amount of operating leverage as you go out that curve of the Bitcoin price. So every cycle, what happens is the Bitcoin stocks tend to stagnate for a while, right? pre having. People are concerned that there's not going to be enough revenue to service the debt or to pay the power contract. But then when Bitcoin rips later in the cycle, because remember, Bitcoin, the price itself is a digital uh, you know, avatar in a sense that, that moves completely on its own, separate from the cost of power and separate from the physical reality of running mining rigs and keeping them plugged in and energized and all that and serviced. Um, and so it can rip separate from the underlying economics of, of Bitcoin mining. So if your economics are good, at increasing uh, levels of Bitcoin price, your business looks more and more profitable. So what tends to happen as the cycle goes on is these, these businesses go from like 30, 40, 50% gross margin businesses to like 80 or 90% gross margin businesses. And when they do that, the stocks tend to go up 5, 10, 15, 20x, sometimes more historically. Um, and, and so that's where the value comes from. Now, like for long periods of time, they may not look like very good investments. Uh, but what I would tell you, Scott, from a balance sheet standpoint, if you buy the right ones that actually own land, they own power contracts, they own buildings, they own electrical infrastructure, substation, et cetera, they plug into the grid. If you're wrong and Bitcoin doesn't go up, you can still repurpose those assets to do other things in high performance computing like AI. And that's the downside protection. That's why I like companies like Iris, where I sit on the board and, and Cypher and others that own some of these hard assets. Um, because I think uh, at the end of the day, even if you're wrong about Bitcoin, you could still be right about the value of high performance computing infrastructure. Yeah. Last time I spoke to Fred Thiel from Marathon, he said, hey, man, we're data centers, right? <laughs> he said, that's how we skin it. That's how we pitch it. Bitcoin happens to be what we're doing. But to your point, the infrastructure is still there if you want to pivot and, and do something else. And when you're looking at these companies, right, I'm trying to discuss how to differentiate them. As you said, I mean, Iris, I know. Uh, there was a time when the stock, as you've mentioned before, was trading far below even the net value of their assets, right? Like you said, they have the land, they have the factories, the power stations, all these things. And somehow when you break down the price of the stock, it doesn't even add up to the value of those assets alone. And that's a classic Graham Dodd, Buffett, Munger type of value discrepancy, which is why, you know, even though I call myself a value investor, I'm pretty heavily into these uh, types of companies. Because literally it was like five or six trading days ago when the stock was at 280, you were buying a dollar of assets for 65 or 70 cents. Um, again, the market's not even pricing in, um, you know, it's not pricing in higher Bitcoin. It's not pricing in AI growth. The company has 600 megawatts in Texas, of which only a very small, like 20 or 40 megawatts is operational. And they're bringing those buildings on. Uh, you know, every few months there's there's 20, 40, 60 megawatts coming online, probably as far as the eye can see. They've got other stuff in their development pipeline. They've got candidly one of the best development pipelines uh, in the space. And I've seen kind of everybody's portfolio of announced uh, projects combined with the, the current projects. Um, and so it's just a really interesting scenario. And I think it speaks to the Wall Street consensus, Scott, to, to be uh, totally clear. I think I think having talked to 
dozens of traders and PMs and analysts uh, just over the last month, month and a half, the kind of consensus right now is that Bitcoin is probably only going to go to 40 or 50,000 uh, this cycle. Now, you keep, do keep that in mind, today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, keep in mind, these are people that haven't been around as long as you or I and Bitcoin and maybe don't believe and have the conviction, but these are the people that drive these stocks, right? Like it's not Joe Schmo retail who buys a hundred or thousand shares of Iris that are moving the stock. It's institutional investors who can put millions to work. And they're largely sort of, I don't understand the economic rationale for these businesses because at a 40 or $50,000 Bitcoin price, it's not that exciting. And I said, well, what about an $80,000 Bitcoin price? And they said, well, if you look at the model there, it's like a very good business. I said, well, maybe you're underestimating the odds that it's going to go uh, there. And that's why I've tweeted recently, Wall Street doesn't understand uh, Bitcoin. Because I literally heard some uh, trader uh, just a week ago say, I think we're near bit peak Bitcoin. And I said, peak Bitcoin at $38,000 Bitcoin? I said, most of us who studied it think it's going to a million dollars over the next 10 years, five years, 15 years, whatever, right? So peak Bitcoin is decades out, I think, if you understand it. But Wall Street thinks peak Bitcoin is now. And that represents the sort of differential in expectations. So yeah, like these businesses aren't great business. Like if Bitcoin's just going to sit at 40,000 for the next three years, there's no reason to buy a Bitcoin miner, period. If you think Bitcoin's going to go to 100,000 or 150,000, then Wall Street's completely wrong. They're going to completely have to pivot at some point to to address that because they're they're completely underexposed to the entire sector, and miners have the highest operating leverage to to the price of Bitcoin. Like MicroStrategy is a great holding; it's pretty conservative actually because the interest rate on the convertible debt is so low, right? And the and the price of Bitcoin is obviously moving higher, but you don't get the same kind of direct operating leverage to the Bitcoin price that you do when you're literally generating new Bitcoin every day, um, like a miner, and so. Yeah, in the short term, micro strategy over the last three, four months, as people were concerned about the halving, it was outperforming the miners. But year to date, a lot of the best miners are still outperforming micro strategy. Yeah, I haven't even looked, but for retail, what's the price of an ASIC right now? I remember at the peak of the last cycle, it was like 20 grand. And at the bottom of this cycle, you could buy them for 1500 bucks. Yeah, yeah. That, those are ge gen generally, I don't know exactly where they peaked in trough, but uh, what's, where, where are they at now? I haven't even looked. And you also have the halving coming. So obviously there's going to be a major discount on miners that might not survive. Yeah, so the pr pr price for an individual units have come down into the single digit, low single digit thousands, as you said. But what's fascinating, Scott, is that literally just six months ago, there was a huge machine glut, which is, which is sort of uh, what you'd expect with Bitcoin prices down here low, with with uh, oversupply from uh, Bitmain, MicroBT, Canaan, used rigs on the market, people who bought too many rigs, uh, you know, a year or two ago, committed to those, and then they're just sitting in a warehouse. All of that supply, from my perspective, has literally been soaked up in the last quarter, and so really? we've gone from a, f a fundamental oversupply to an undersupply, and you could see that in these large machine orders. CleanSpark just placed an order with Bitmain for four x a hash. I know Court Scientific had that huge deal two months ago because yeah, they were bankrupt. Bit, BitFarms just did a <laughs> secondary and then announced a massive uh, order uh, yesterday. The stock stock ripped. Iris and Cypher both bought the new Bitmain machines. Um, they're out for like the first half of next year. You can't get the the new Bit, Bitmain S21. That, that's got like a 17 joules per terahash efficiency, which is way better than the S19s. And, yeah. and, and, and so like you're basically everybody's in a rush to upgrade their machine efficiency because post having you yeah. can control are your S19s power costs. Gonna, are, are S19s even going to be effective post having? I mean, it depends. It depends on where global hash rate goes and depends on price, right? So that's the thing people miss about this space. They, they think it's like a one variable or even a two variable space, but there's really a lot more variables than that. And some of them are reactive to each other. So if one thing goes up, another thing adjusts. And so like a lot of people are like, well, if global hash rate keeps going up like this, like nobody's going to make money. And it's like, well, think about it a little bit more deeply. Like after the halving, do you really think global hash rate's really going to go march straight up from 500 to 600 to 700 to 800? Or do you think it's more likely if the price doesn't confirm that by marching up and doubling um, that, that, you know, at some point, some of those uneconomic machines will come off. And so the people who do have efficient machines and low power costs will actually be more profitable post having because it will wipe out some percentage of the hash that shouldn't be mining anyway well in this cycle it's good to see some of the smart companies buying those machines now as opposed to the huge orders you mentioned before at the top of the next cycle that a huge issue obviously for miners core scientific i, I mentioned one of them is that 
Bitcoin price was at 65,000. Miners were at historic highs in price and everyone thought it was going to 100, 150, 200 last cycle yeah. and put in these massive orders and then the market just crashed, right? And like you said, those machines, they had to pay for them a year later. They're sitting in warehouses or they were. So it is nice to see these massive orders happening before the cycle this time. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the best companies are all uh, aggressively out in front of the cycle. I mean, look at CleanSpark last year, even when people were still hiding out in a bunker uh, and that might have been actually rational for for a quarter or two. CleanSpark was out buying facilities, like securing uh, more machines. They, they use their ATM quite effectively, and that's something people have to realize: is you know these companies have to, the capital has to come from somewhere. It's not free money, right? You either so they're have selling to, Bitcoin to do that. I mean, is that the implication? No, or they're selling equity. They... Almost every large miner has a, a what's called an ATM and at the at the market facility, and they're able to essentially sell. Uh, equity into the market every day via their brokers. Um, and so they're diluting the stock. Uh, the question is always like, if you're diluting the stock, is it shareholder accretive? So if I take a dollar from you as you buy my equity and I, and I put a, a new share in the market, can I take that dollar and turn it into two or three dollars by mining Bitcoin? And at this part of the cycle, I think the answer is yes. And so it's, it's funny, like uh, over a full cycle, it's not always clear that everybody is generating shareholder value because some of these firms, they, they borrow a lot of money hundreds of millions or, or they print a lot of equity and they overpay for machines. They overpay for power. They overpay for sites. They don't run their operation profitably. And so what, what nets out at the end, somebody might make money if they trade correctly, right? If you, if you buy the stocks in December of last year and sell them in Q2 of 2025, you can almost close your eyes and make money buying any miner. But if you are looking at the actual average result across all of the shareholders, in a lot of cases, it's negative. Because what's happening is the companies are essentially destroying shareholder value by making poor and mistimed investments, as you said, like buying the machines at the top uh, with essentially shareholder capital. I think what's happened in the last six months is the aggressive good companies are actually going to use the ATM capital, the capital they, they got from selling their shares into the market, to actually grow into the cycle in an intelligent way. And I've already seen, I've already talked to several of those companies who uh, raise money at various points when the stocks were kind of hot over the last nine months, and now they've sort of slowed down, right? Because they're now fully funded to their next uh, growth trajectory, their next their next sort of growth target, and so they don't need to use the ATM. So it's about it's about raising equity and debt in an intelligent ways that don't risk the equity, that don't that, that don't cost shareholders money in the long run. And uh, we'll see which management teams can do that. You, you can learn a lot from spending time with them, right? I've spent time with pretty much all of the teams in the top ten or fifteen. Um, I know the CEO as well. I know in a lot of cases, some of the board members, I know how they think about capital allocation. And what you're what you're always asking yourself is, does this CEO care about my return as an investor? Because it's one right. thing to like be constantly growing and telling a good story of the market. It's another thing to actually generate returns that accrue to shareholders. And then sometimes there's a gap between what people are saying publicly and what they're actually doing. And, and that's hard to assess, but that's what I try to do. Absolutely. You mentioned the steadily rising hash rate. It's been going absolutely parabolic if you take a look at what's been going on. There's been this sort of idea circulating that I think we can dispel probably, but there's maybe something to it conceptually. This was from Plan B and the guy Marty Party Music. They basically are speculating that miners have been selling uh, Bitcoin directly to BlackRock to seed the ETF so as not to move the market and saying that based on historical hash rates, USD ratio, being that the hash rate is pumping and price is not followed, that Bitcoin should be at fifty five to fifty eight thousand right now. Do you think that there's anything to the idea that BlackRock is somewhat surreptitiously or any of these are buying Bitcoin direct from miners or OTC so as not to rock the price on the open market? So you have to extrapolate this a little bit. Like for, first off, Plan B posted something the other day that to, at least to me implied that he doesn't actually understand how how mining works. There was a, a tweet that he posted that implied there was some relationship between one factor and, and global hash rate and there's actually no uh, relationship. I, I, I think it is true because I've heard this from several people that BlackRock is out in the market talking to large existing holders of Bitcoin. So I can confirm that with like 100% veracity that, yeah. that, that those conversations are happening. They do need to source large amounts. They don't necessarily want to have a huge amount of slippage uh, if there's a lot of demand for this product. And so they're trying to make sure that that Bitcoin's available. It is certainly possible at some point they could buy buy them from miners, but but keep in mind that that supply is sort of fungible. So, if they don't buy it from miners, they can buy it OTC. If they don't buy it from OTC, they can buy it from exchanges. And so, if they were to buy 
from miners directly, they're removing the primary source of cell pressure. And so it absolutely would have uh, a positive impact on price over time because that's a every Bitcoin they buy from a miner is a, is a Bitcoin that doesn't get dumped on the market on the exchange. Um, so this idea that like they can secretly buy elsewhere and not move the price is sort of, it's a falsehood. Like it's a clear falsehood. That's not the way uh, markets work. If somebody's doing large buying anywhere from a forced seller or a seller who is going to sell anyway, um, you know, it's a counterfactual because we don't know exactly what would happen if they didn't sell the BlackRock and they sold on the exchange. But the reality is like it's going to positively impact the price if you have a large buyer soaking up supply from any of those venues. Do you think that that relationship between hash rate and USD is productive to look at? I mean, do you think that that is an indication that price should follow because hash rate has skyrocketed so high? Well, I think hash rate usually leads price over the long run. Like the divergence shouldn't get too wide before it starts to close. My suspicion is um, at some point at the middle of next year, hash rate will have started to flatline or come down um, depending on where Bitcoin price is. So Bitcoin price will either rise quite substantially confirming that that uh, 500x a hash or so is, is rational um, or the, the that 500x a hash will turn into 400 or 350 to confirm that you know the the people were a little bit exuberant and keep in mind that like up until literally the moment of the having it might be rational to keep old machines running at higher power prices because you might be marginally profitable until literally the having and so it's like one of those things where people say, oh, this is priced in or not priced in. It, it sort of doesn't matter. What It doesn't really matter. Like what actually matters is what happens the moment the event actually happens. Because it because it, somebody could see the wall coming, but it might be rational to drive all the way up to the wall uh, before, <laughs> yeah. before, you, before you slow down. <clears throat> and so hypothetically, like hash rate could continue to march higher. I suspect that, you know, as we talked about in one of your, I think in August, uh, we, did a, we did one of these and I said, Bitcoin's going to, to 40K. Uh, before the halving, that was a little bit more contrarian at 30. I also said on that, I, I reviewed it and then I said I, it could go down to 25, then up to 40, and then down to 35. It literally did we're, it. Yeah. We're it, more or less <laughs> following that kind of pattern. I think from where we are now, given that the ETF catalyst is probably going to be on the books until early January, and given the seasonality, given where DXY is and, and yields, like it's much more likely we're going to kind of the mid 40s, probably by the end of the year, but certainly by the halving. Um, and I think at that level, it's sort of starting to confirm that the hash rate uh, explosion was sort of rational from from the beginning. Um, and and of course, once you get into the mid 40s, and, and then it's like, well, why can't we go to the mid 50s because of how reflexive Bitcoin is? So I wouldn't be surprised to see a 50k Bitcoin price before the halving. I think again, 40k was is still my base case, but that that might be gone in the next week, and in which case, like everybody's going to have to ch you know change their models. Yeah, I was taking a look at uh, Iris yesterday based on one of our conversations. And I bought, I think I told you 350. I looked, it was about 385. I bought it yesterday. It's literally a pre market 463 in a day. Yep. Right. I mean, so these are starting to move. Right. I haven't even looked across the entire market, but is this uh, indicative of what's happening with all miners at this very moment? Like, I mean, have they all been pumping the past few days? Well, Iris and CleanSpark have been outperforming the last week. But, but if you look year to date, you know, CleanSpark was underperforming all year. Uh, Hut was uh, outperforming early in the year, and then since then has been one of the worst. Um, you know, Cipher was was actually the top performer up until like three or four weeks ago when one of their large holders did a did a did a secondary did a did a block sale basically in the public market that surprised a lot of people, including me. I knew they were going to do it. I just didn't knew they were going to do it at that price. Right. So things can change in the space but like the, what i'd say scott is like we went public uh, at iris in november 2021 at 28 dollars a share um you know partially we went public at 28 dollars a share because i was in the pricing discussion and i, and I said we should stay firm because uh, there was some discussion of of lowering it just a little bit to make sure we got out we were like the last bitcoin mining company that got public before the kind of collapse in 2021 and so the stock went from 28 to one the company didn't get 96 percent less valuable it's just investor expectations about the value of assets mining bitcoin got 96 percent uh, less valuable right during during that period and so this is this is why value investing is so helpful um, i have no idea where the stock uh, goes in the very short term but i do think in the long run with bitcoin at higher prices like the value of all these assets should be some multiple of where it is now so even though it's moved up you know, 50% in the last three or four trading days. I mean, the real value of those assets is not, is not 
80 or 90 percent of the assets it's probably some multiple of those assets because they're going to be quite profitable if bitcoin's at higher prices so you have to have a view on where bitcoin's going if you do if you have a view on that and you have a view on things like transaction fees because one of the underpriced components here is if udi keeps making these jpeg wizards that was going to be keep... my next question i'm glad you jumped on it because ordinals yeah. it seems like miners should love these <laughs> they, i think they, I, yeah i think they should too and the reality is some of the big ones are not even really paying attention because they don't think it's sustainable remember these are hard asset guys like the good miners like energy infrastructure right they like like 40 year building lives they like construction right they, they like heavy duty stuff and so they look at this like frivolous stuff on the blockchain and it's like well thanks for the revenue but like we don't think you're going to be around and right i think that might be wrong because i think inscriptions might evolve into like the way in which you sort of put something into the the record public record forever like i think I like serious business stuff transactions the property titles, uh, legal agreements, et cetera, might eventually end up on a immutable blockchain like Bitcoin because there's no guarantee that if you use some of these other chains that the chain just won't be reorganized. But with Bitcoin, given the hash rate, given the investment into it, it might be the place to do that. And so Udi might just be showing people a way to use that four megabytes of block space to actually add real value. And if that's the case, then the people who are finding blocks, that block space should go up in value quite substantially. And it might counterweight some of the having losses. So, like, like you're going to lose right. three uh, Bitcoin or so uh, in, in the sort of block reward, right? The, the the for for winning the block. But what if you get a big chunk of that back via the block space and transaction fees? And so, I, I think I think people are definitely underpricing that. It's not really in the models. Even the miners themselves don't necessarily believe it's sustainable. So, if they turn out to be sustainable, that's another tailwind for this space. There was a time earlier this year where those uh, those were outweighing the mining rewards, right? So I, I would think that they would pay attention if they saw even for a brief glimpse of time that they could make more money on the transaction fees than and on the, the mining fees. And but. this isn't a bear market. Remember what happens in a bull market is the transaction fees go up anyway, right. even without ordinals and inscriptions. And that's the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is it's, it's the system that's pretty organic. It, it's like a living system, right? And it, it changes and evolves on its own well past what anyone can predict even just a few years earlier and so i just think yeah like the revenue gets cut in half uh at the top line with just one component of the potential revenue but i don't think that's the end of the story there's also like analytics plays here some of these companies are actually developing beyond like ai like they're developing like software custom firmware things that are highly unique ip that i think a lot of people view this industry as just a commodity business, um, right. like like a gold miner and everybody does things exactly the same way. And there's like a 2% advantage from doing certain things. And I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing some companies have like a 20% advantage over others via the way they operate um, along a, a number of different dimensions. And I think that'll prove out this cycle. Um, but right now it's still a speculation, right? Like I, I believe that, but the market doesn't believe that yet. And so they're still viewing them as commodity stocks. And, and I'm not sure that's true. I know we're slightly going over time here, but I do want to ask you one more question. This study came out, reveals Bitcoin mining as a catalyst for renewable energy growth and flexible load systems. Okay. I mean, that's something that Bitcoiners have been screaming for a long time, but do you think that, I mean, now we're doing Hamas FUD instead, right? So maybe we're off the environment and we're on to terrorist funding and Hamas, but do you think that we are relatively finished with the narrative that Bitcoin is boiling the oceans? Now we have the king of ESG. Larry Fink, the guy who literally created this environmental side of the invest, investing, he's out on a road show, show supporting a Bitcoin spot ETF. We know that there's places that Bitcoin's helping sustain the grid. Do you think that we may be done with this part of the Bitcoin FUD, the environmental side? I mean, of course, the answer is no. Like We're, we're not going to be done for decades because there's always going to be somebody who doesn't understand the sector and is afraid of it. Um, so until everybody in the world is is gaining some direct benefit from this and they can see it and understand it, um, like a washing machine, right? Like no one's going to argue washing machines are, are wasted energy because everybody loves their washing machine. Problem with Bitcoin is there are a lot of people who still don't have any exposure to Bitcoin and they read the headlines and it's attractive to them because they want to hate Bitcoin anyway. So I, I think the narrative is changing. Like a lot of good people have done a lot of good work over the last year. And so there are more examples of mainstream media and, and policymakers uh, putting out stuff that tells you their understanding 
this, but like in the long run, it sort of doesn't matter. Like if you're building uh, large scale infrastructure in Texas and West Texas, like you are, you are improving those communities. Those communities are going to fight to keep you irrespective of what the political uh, landscape is in DC or like what the media says of the New York times. It sort of doesn't matter because in West Texas, you can't stop miners and a lot of the developments happening there. Um, so I think time will sort of solve a lot of this as, as people see the societal value of what these companies bring. They're, they're literally going to like rural communities where there was no interest in the real estate. The tax revenues were really low. Any heavy industry that was there before has left and they're coming in and they're totally revitalizing these areas. So um, I, I think at some point people are just going to say, screw off, you know, left wingers. Uh, you guys don't have bring any value to this debate. Like well, we care about real world stuff, like whether the taxes get paid and the schools are open. Well, I love that we uh, crushed 30 minutes specifically talking about miners. There were other topics I want to talk to you about, but you got to come back soon. I want to put a bow on Binance with you as well at some point. In the not Anytime. So we could do a separate not space once we figure out whether CZ is going to be in prison or not. For yeah, I think that'll, yeah, I think that'll be uh, very interesting. Some people are saying longer. I'm not buying it, but uh, we'll discuss. Guys, uh, Mike should be in the description. Yeah, he is. His Twitter name is in the description. When I'm on my own producer, I don't really know what ends up anywhere on, on YouTube these days, but uh Mike, thank you very much, everybody. Please follow him. Always uh, great to get the perspective. And I mean, I, I'm very convinced after you sort of like uh, hinted at it to me and I've heard you talking about it. it, made me do a deep dive. And I really want, you know, I know there's been a real thirst for this information. You've had people asking you all the time, like do a stream, do a spaces, do something, explain this. So I'm glad that we got to do it here. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate Thanks, it. Mike. I always see uh, over here, by the way, in the comments, uh, where are you? Crypto golfer. Where are you, buddy? Always saying hi from Vero Beach. Where Where is it? It's here somewhere. Good morning. Uh, see, good morning from Vero Beach. I live in Florida, and I I always see this. And Vero Beach holds a very special place in my heart. When I was growing up, I was a huge Dodger fan. I was born in L.A. My family was from Brooklyn when they were the Brooklyn Dodgers. I grew up literally everything in my room was Dodger everything. Fernando Valenzuela, the pitcher on the Dodgers, was my hero. And so we used to go down to Vero Beach where they had Dodger Town, and it was incredible. And two of the like most momentous events in my life happened in Vero Beach. One of them was that we literally chased, probably should have done this, chased for Fernando Valenzuela to his uh, airplane. They were leaving, and I wanted to get his autograph. And someone was like, he's going to the airport. And we went there, and he wouldn't sign an autograph. And my brother, my older brother, literally like screamed at him, you're my brother's hero. Why are you being an asshole? And then... Uh, it was, it was, I think Jesse Orozco was with him, the other pitcher, and he got him to sign the ball for me. He was like, come on, Pedro. That's what I called Fernando Valenzuela. Come on, Pedro, man. Sign a ball for the kid. And the other one was that my dad's like lifelong hero, the only person I think could have ever like shaken my father's stoicism was Sandy Koufax. And at the time, in the 1980s, Sandy Koufax was actually one of the pitching coaches for the Dodgers just helping out and... We met Sandy Koufax at Dodger Town. My dad was like literally, fr I've never seen my father uh, look like that. He couldn't even speak to the guy. We took a picture of him. So Vero Beach, I, I didn't know why we'd go on a rant on Vero Beach. And just before that, Mike Alfred talked about West Texas. Well, I've got Texas West Capital. All right, dude, are you like building miners out there? Is that what you're doing in your spare time? Are you, uh, uh, you're, I know you're there. You can give us the man on the street uh, view of what's <laughs> happening with the mining industry in West Texas. Yeah, no, I, I leave that to the professionals. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's been coming for a while. It's been building up, uh, you know, uh, Texas, uh, we've got land. <laughs> uh, we got lots of land and, um, you know, every, everything from, um, you know, it, it was oil and then uh, wind farms and, uh, you know, based on all that energy and all that excess we've got there, the flaring on the uh, oil wells and, uh, all that kind of stuff, you know, the big Bitcoin miners started coming in and, and using all that, um, you know, stuff that would normally have been wasted, uh, using it to power the miners. So um, it's a good symbiotic type relationship there where, you know, we were going to blow off all this energy and, and all this stuff anyway. And, uh, you know, someone coming in there and using that. So uh, I don't have a problem with it at all. And, and, and then there's the whole thing about, um, you know, Texas has its own uh, electric grid and uh, the miners actually help with that, you know, the thing about grids is they have to stay stable, right? You can't have these big fluctuations. And so, um, you know, when, when there's a big demand all of a sudden, right, when it gets really hot out here or, you know, really cold, um, which it does occasionally, uh, you know, the, the, the miners are in agreements with, uh, to shut off their mining and, uh, you know, that, that helps keep the, the grid more stabilized and, uh, you know, keeps us from, uh, really wishing we were somewhere else. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it works out all right.
I love the comments over here. Beans and Rice says, Lubbock, Texas. Texas That's right. Texas, baby. They says, cotton, cattle, oil, wind farms, and short skirts. I assume he's yeah. talking about the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders now. And all right, let's talk about some <laughs> charts, although I can do short skirts all day. <laughs> but let's talk about some charts. What are you looking at right now, man? Oh, uh, man, still same thing here with uh, with Bitcoin. You know, again, uh, we've been talking about this since we got the breakout here and the idea that we would continue to accumulate and then break out higher. Uh, that is exactly what it looks like we're doing here. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people waiting for that pullback, but as you and I have talked about so many times before, uh, especially in uh, the early stages of a Bitcoin bull market, you usually don't get the pullback you're looking for. So um, uh, Max I Payne right now is definitely the sidelines. Yeah. And there's no question. Ma it Max is. Payne is, is, I'll buy 35, dip. I'll buy the 32 dip, I'll buy the 25 dip. It's just not, you they, don't they, they keep moving their dip buys up high. They just never get to the dip. So, yeah. Uh, and then when they do, they get nervous, right? They get nervous here. And then it well, goes up. They still have to buy at 12K. They still have to buy at 12K, Chris. Yeah. Well, you yeah, know, well you know, certain big accounts still do, but we won't go there anyway. Um, yeah. So, you know, again, nothing uh, different looking here, really looking at a 41 and a half to 42,000 next kind of, um, you know, target up there. You know, I, I heard my, uh, uh, Mike there talking about, uh, you know, looking at uh, 40 and potentially 50, uh, you know, by, by the, uh, the having, uh, again, you know, nothing I haven't been talking about since, uh, gosh, probably what Q1 of this year. Um, and so it just, you know, again, even, even if we don't look at the current structure and what's going on here, typically Bitcoin retraces that 61, eight, at least of the whole bear market, um, prior to the, you know, uh, to the having. So, Nothing surprised here. It keeps doing what we expect it to do. Uh, and people are going to keep fighting their emotions because uh, it's tough. It's tough. You know, it's tough if you're, a, if you're a trader out there and you haven't gotten it down yet. And you've got accounts that say things that sound like they really make sense. And, you know, you're emotional. You're worried about losing money. You don't know a whole lot about risk management, proper risk management, whatnot. And so, um, you know, it's, it's tough and it keeps you on the sidelines. It keeps you on the sidelines all the way up here all the way up. And then, you know, you were going to buy the dip here, but then it got the new and Oh man, no, it's, it's really going to go down because everybody's screaming how it's going to go down. Then it goes up. You go, Oh man, I swear to God, if it comes back, I'm going to buy it. Comes back again. You're like, Oh man, no, I'm not going to do it. It breaks out again. And like you said, going lower. Yeah. Cause you got it. Yeah. You got, you got, you got, you got, you got to go lower. Yeah. Pa the pain's on the sidelines. So now we always have this sort of like interplay between what Bitcoin's going to do and what all coins are going to do, obviously, right? You want to kind of be in all coins when Bitcoin is sideways and chilling, but there's no major fear of it going down, right? It goes yeah. up, it accumulates, you want to be in all coins. I'm not a big fan of charting Bitcoin dominance, by the way, because it's not a traded asset. There's no, there's no uh, reason that there would be, uh, you know, resistance and support because there's no person buying or setting orders. But I think that everyone's watching and it gives us an indication. It looks to me like Bitcoin dominance is breaking out here. If yeah. for people who do chart it, that doesn't mean, by the way, guys, you know, you see that and people panic. That just means that maybe this is like a time where Bitcoin's going to kind of carry the market up a bit. If Bitcoin's going up and dominance is going up, you're not going to lose money on your alt. You're just losing Bitcoin value. But this feels like one of those moments where maybe people are going to start focusing back on Bitcoin for a little while while alts consolidate. Yeah. Yeah. You know, again, that would make sense because, you know, we are consolidating right up here um, at that uh, that daily R1 pivot right at the top of that uh, that um, range here. And so, you know, above the EQ looking to get that that breakout higher. So, yeah, you know, um, it, it would make sense. You know, everybody going to kind of jump in there or at least uh, enough that it, it brings that dominance up with it, as you're seeing. And, um, you know, and then people will be back to alts. I mean, at this point, I think people are they're just still doing well. Uh, they're still doing yeah. well, like I oh said, God, on the USD yeah. pair. And some of them, like, now it's just weird. This this time, it's like you really actually have to pay attention and find the right ones. <laughs> like, you know, if you remember the real alt seasons of the past, it's like just literally buy anything and wait three days. Yeah, yeah. Right but, now, I, I, now, like, most of them are actually still underperforming, even though you <laughs> see these few select ones that are just ripping. Yeah, but I think we'll be back to that though. I don't think um, I don't think that's something that's only in the you know in the rearview mirror. I think we'll be coming yeah. back to oh, that. I, I, I like alt here. For I'm just saying, I think it's oh, one yeah. of those temporary things. If you're aggressively trading it, where we might see some FOMO back into Bitcoin if it starts to really push and hold above 38. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So you know, um, you know me, I'm a big uh, mostly uh, you know I trade uh, the larger caps here, um, looking for liquidity, what looking got? for stuff like Tell that. What you but, got. Um, but for everybody here. <laughs> um, first of all, who the heck's buying IOTA, man? Look at that. Up almost 42% in the last couple hours here. 
Oh. You, you, you bring out like the classics from the past <laughs> cycles that I have forgotten even existed. But look at, I mean, look at that and look at the volume. Uh, it's, it's huge. It's huge. Somebody came in and um, popped it up. And, you know, for me, it looks like a third wave. Uh, you know, right here, you get a one, a two, and a three. So I think it'll probably go a bit higher here. Um, wouldn't be surprised to maybe see it getting up here around uh, maybe about 26 cents or so. Uh, overall but again that's just this local right here that's just this one two three get a four get a five um but you know again we do have these other kind of moves up so you know it's like everything else i think uh we're just kind of getting into the whole let's move higher with it um you can see that right uh, let's see right around this area right here we had this good kind of breakout and had a quick wick back down but back up found support again at this uh kind of this um horizontal support area and kind of throw it in there real quick like that so many charts look like this it's amazing yeah yeah i mean it, it really is great you can go out there and you can find a whole lot of charts and the fact is with so many of them looking like this it really just kind of if you're if you're wondering oh my god are things going to break down is bitcoin going to go down back below you know twelve thousand or something i i think it, it's so so far unlikely i mean i can't guarantee obviously can't guarantee anything but the odds of that is so significantly low um, and especially with the more and more charts that we're seeing like this, which appear to be making these longer term uh, bottoming type areas, right? This one isn't, uh, you know, again, right here, you know. Um, so I, I think I think you just kind of, you, you got to You got to be looking long. You got to be looking long in the market right now. Uh, yeah. What else are you looking at? I mean, that, so the how do we find the IOTA is right before the IOTA. <laughs> yeah. You just, you just got to see that. And this is the whole thing. You know, this is what I talk about all the time, right? So. Um, you know, picking bottoms and tops is not an easy thing, but it is definitely very doable as people have seen. I've been doing this all year long. Right. And, um, it's just, man, you've really got to get it. I, I, I can't say it enough. You really got to get into Wyckoff and not just the silly stuff. The couple of things that you read online, you actually have to get real education. You got to get real training in it. Um, because otherwise you read what you find online and you really don't have a full understanding of what's being said. Um, and you assume, oh, it's this quick overview thing that people are saying, and then you wonder why it doesn't work, right? But man, I tell you, there's so much of it out there. And, you know, we've got uh, right here, local. Well, here's a local chart. Let me give you this local chart right here. So we've got this range going on. This is AR, USDT. Are we? Yeah. And um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think I think we've got a, a one up here um, and we're pulling back for two. So I think we're coming back here around um, seven, $7.52 to maybe $7.63. This is that 50% to 61.8 retracement. We could go down to 70 half at $7.43. But basically, the idea is we're looking to pull back about mid-range, and then we should kind of pop out higher. So I've got targets of uh, $8 and basically 63 cents, $9.25, and then $9.63. Once we get this pullback uh, toward this, um, uh, this uh, retracement area here, kind of fill it in this fair value gap, uh, and maybe even this little bit of a fair, uh, fair value gap as well. So... Um, I think, you know, if you're looking for a little bit shorter term play, I usually look a lot, you know, larger terms to give people really some time to look at it. But this one, um, yeah, this is the four hour chart. So I think it's a good setup there coming in with it. Have you looked at Coinbase, by the way, speaking of Wyckoff, have you looked at the coin chart of late? Oh man, I've got, yeah, I've got a, oh man. Want my something leaving accumulation. <laughs> uh, let me do this. Guys, see this thing. I, did, I didn't mean to, uh, I didn't mean to, you know, uh, catch you off guard. But let's see how uh, yours looks the same as mine. I mean, look at this range. It's just leaving. I mean, my gosh. Yeah, I absolutely love Okay, there we go. Here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I might have to go back and re redo this um, range. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, started, but, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, big news. Yeah, big news here. You know, I think we're probably um, coming off the bottom here. I think we're probably five waves up. So looking for a, a pullback now, uh, yep. maybe. And I was looking off this, uh, you know, right around here around this $72, $73 range. I was looking for this rally up to uh, the EQ of this uh, area. You got a long right here. there on the chart. Nobody can deny it. You pulled up your chart and there was a long <laughs> position with a stop loss right there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, and 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 it wouldn't have been wouldn't been a higher, but you know, we, we don't worry about it. it's 117 and a half was the target. It went up to you know 129 basically. I mean, but you know, a lot of traders, especially newer ones, again, they're like, oh my god, you know, left money on the table. Well, no, I got I got a 12 and a half R on this. I I, I risked one percent and made 12 and a half times that. I mean, in in a month, it's it's you know one trade. It left me 99 percent of my capital to trade elsewhere. 
Um, it's, it's an amazing trade. It was a great trade. And, uh, you know, uh, people, man, I, I was surprised how many people, because I posted this uh, the other day and how many people got really kind of offended that I would have gotten out of the trade here. Uh, uh, but, you know, it was local here. I do have, you know, larger targets, one, two, one, two here, potentially going up. Or it's, uh, you know, five up here and pull back. But either way, not too really worried about it. I think we're going to get some pullback on that um, now. So, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, like I, I it, tried you know? not to get too cute with coin. I just bought it all the way down. Uh, now yeah, I'm yeah. actually almost <laughs> even, which is fun. Yeah, yeah. I might trade well, around. I think, that was though, too. I think, I mean, you just showed the RSI there. You can see, I mean, it's at like not almost uh, top to 87. I, mean, I can, I have it here. I mean, this is. Oh this yeah, looks, yeah. I mean, it's ahead. as overbought as it's ever been. So if you are looking to trade around a position, this seems like a reasonable place to kind of catch a, catch a, catch a dip. But yeah, I'm looking to see what it's going to do now. If, yeah. Don't need to get. I wouldn't like go selling your whole position right now if it's an investment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think that was the one that Jim Cramer when it first came out was like, oh man, it's a buy here at like 400 or something. Uh, and then he kind of said, oh yeah, it's it, get rid of it when it was down toward the bottom and. Man, I don't know, man. Kramer, he seems like an emotional trader. It kills me. It kills me. I hate to see it, it but you know, it is what it is. All right. Um, I, I interrupted your flow there with Coinbase, but uh, I see flow. No, that's Actually, right. Speaking of which, I see flow right there, so I don't want to interrupt your flow. <laughs> no pun intended. Well, this is one I'm really kind of liking here, um, ADA. So, you know, everybody, everybody has personal opinions. The Cardano yeah. people are going to be so happy. I get yelled at in the comments every day. You purposely ignore ADA. See, we're not purposely ignoring you guys. Go ahead. Nobody purposely ignores. No, we just got like, you know, 78,000 coins, you know. <laughs> we just yeah. we just find what we can. But, you know, everybody's got all these personal opinions about, you know, why certain cryptos need to do whatever. Guys, I'm going to tell you what right now. None of the cryptos out there are worth anything more than their chart at the moment, okay? It is still basically just a speculation. You know, everybody with, oh, this team is great and it's going to do this and they got these partnerships. It's no different than what it was, the ICO craze back in 2017. Um, you know, there, there's nobody out that's going to stand out just because of whatever right now. Trade the damn charts, right? Yeah, I said that. Um, so this one, I mean, you know, we're looking good here. We've got, you know, five, a pretty clear five waves up. We pulled back 50% here. Um, you know, we've got this accumulation, which looks pretty good in here uh, with our uh, – this dip, we got like this spring here with this great bit of volume. And then we had a test and this test had significantly less volume. That's what we're looking for. And that's why we're getting this rally back up. Overall, I think uh, initially and minimally, we've got this target up here around 76 cents, um, right here around the EQ of, uh, you know, this right above that weekly pivot area there. But, you know, honestly, I mean, to me, it looks like, uh, you know, we continue up to new highs. Um, I'm looking for a breakout above this swing high right here at about a dollar twenty-four or so. If we can get that, uh, I feel pretty dang positive about new all-time highs. Uh, I've got a couple of sh you know local targets here at five dollars and twenty cents and six dollars and thirty-eight cents. I'm just gonna go start tweeting about ADA right now and how Chris is such <laughs> a bull, so that I can get some new friends and maybe they'll leave me alone. There you go, right? But I mean, this this is a clean chart. I mean, this is so clean. The movement is so nice and easy here on the weekly. Uh, the range here is just absolutely beautiful. You know, I, I think you probably get like a rally up and a pullback and a rally up higher and then a pullback and then you kind of get that movement out. Uh, but overall, we're kind of getting to that point where we're going to see that big move up. Um, so, you know, I, you, if you buy in here, I mean, you have to buy in with the thought of this bigger chart, right? Because you're going to get pullbacks along the way. You might get a pullback to the, uh, the EQ of the range here at around uh, 32 cents, 31 cents. Uh, but a lot of people, they, you know, they'll, they'll look at this chart and they'll go along here and they'll put their stop loss at like 38 cents. But you can't do that. It's a weekly chart. Why would you do that? Right. So yeah. um, I, I think, you know, I think you can probably get in here. You know, you put your stop loss down here if you have to, uh, if you're going to get in here on this big weekly. But, you know, again, weekly, you're looking for the big moves up. So, you know, you, you can zoom into a smaller time frame and probably get a better chart. But I mean, just overall, I, I think it's, it's looked great. Accumulations are just about done in here. Um, and we should be breaking out higher on that. Perfect. What else you got? Uh, let me see here. I've got RPL, USDT. Um, so this is kind of interesting. Uh, I'm looking at the possibility that maybe we've got a one, two, three, and a four here. We've got this wedge, looking for a break out of the wedge. Target of 2885, which basically is just this uh, descending channel resistance. 
And so the idea is we'll get, you know, there'll be one up there. We'll pull two to the pullback and then three will pop on out. Um, and we'll really kind of get moving with that. So um, I think overall, you know, especially if this is kind of holding right around this area we're at, it's about a 50% pullback. We'll see what happens here. It's kind of trying to pull back a little bit more, but um, you know, we'll look for that, that breakout of this wedge to kind of get us that movement up to the descending channel resistance. And then I'd look for a, Either it'll pop out really hard and head up here toward the R1 at $30, $30 or uh, $30 and 30 cents or so, or it'll get rejected, pull back around where it is here and then break out. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm open to either thing happening there. Um, let me see what else I got. Uh, oh, I've got Tau USDT, man. This thing's been popping up a lot, as you can see. Obviously, I, and I've been hearing, I've been hearing about it a lot. I, I was made fun of on Spaces. People they were talking about. I was like, "What is a Tau? I have no idea." And then I know <laughs> Rand did like an entire show on it. I'm so behind the times on the new alts, but yeah. Well, well you you know me, man. I never really know what these things do. I just uh, Tau and Tia have been the two, <laughs> like TAO and TIA are the ones that everybody, uh, which is not TIA craft apparently, but it's actually an <laughs> offline, but uh, for the boomers. But uh, yeah, so these have been very hot topics. Yeah, I mean, so we're looking good here. We're kind of uh, range bound here. Um, if we can get a breakout of this uh, resistance, I think we probably go to three seventy seven. If we get a breakdown, I think there's a good chance we see one forty eight and a half. Um, in which case, then we'd look for um, a bigger rally up out of there, probably up here around uh, 481 or so, uh, if we do that. So, you know, uh, really just to kind of keep it simple here, and this is the daily, uh, you know, if we can get a breakout of the uh, of the range resistance here, we go 377, if we get a breakdown, potentially as far down here is around, you know, 148 and a half, and then we'd look for a reversal there to kind of carry us back up here around um, – 481 or so uh but yeah i mean it's just absolutely just fantastic movement here um you know where where, where did you want to buy you wanted to buy right here you wanted to buy this right here um, i think that's the case with most of these coins right now there was oh, it a is, better it entry is. there was a much better entry than whatever you're getting today you have to accept that sorry oh yeah yeah you can't sit there and cry about it at all i mean look at that. the range is on they're looking great and then you had the breakout and then you had the jump across the creek here but you know again it's the same thing with bitcoin right so this is no different than bitcoin's recent reaccumulation area you get the breakout everybody expects the pullback to retest instead it just accumulates as it's rising here and then pops out higher right i mean this is the same basically the same dang thing we're looking at on uh, on bitcoin at the moment here so I just want to point that out because so many people think, you know, price always has to come back. It doesn't ever have to do anything other than what it's going to do. Um, let me see here. Last one. I've got flow here. Flow. Uh, let's see. Flow is still pulling back here. We, we've got this 60. Let me see. What are we at? We're right about 61.8. Eh. We may or may not get uh, the breakout here, but. If we can, let me set 70 and a half right there around 64, 64 and a half cents. So that'd probably be where I'm looking. If we can get that and it reverses back out and breaks out higher here, uh, I think we've probably, you know, 72 cents and then um, just about 74 cents as the two targets up there. If we can get this reversal around that 70 and a half, uh, four hour, let me see, what does that one hour look like? Come on. Yeah, yeah. One hour's looking like we might get that uh, from day. around that area. Yeah. That's so, pretty good. Someone yep. was asking us yesterday about SEI. Did you see that? Say, I think it's called. Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, and then I was going to do it, Twitter. and then you were like. Yeah, I know. And then I, I had just posted it, and I was like, damn, that's a nice rounding bottom if you're looking for a launch. I mean, I guess get called a rounding sure. bottom since there was never a top, but that's a pretty hell of a nice pattern. And I yeah. said on Twitter yesterday, this reminds me so much. I don't know what it's going to do, guys, whatever. But it reminds me so much of when Elrond ERD became EGLD. It oh, launched yeah. did this rounding bottom. This was my entry. I've talked about forever. I was so bullish on this. It went <laughs> five hundred bucks from ten bucks. It yeah, is. It was great. It's great. Five hundred and forty-four. I'm still. I mean, I still have a large position in this. But uh, I mean, that just like that launch when it rounds out like that and then breaks out and look at that retest. I mean, that pretty and pretty bullish. The There's a lot of buying. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's where I like to see those types of uh, those rounding bottoms like that right there where it's, it's just kind of launched, launches up, pulls back into that big, you know, extended rounded bottom because that's a lot of accumulation going on there. Just waiting to do that. And then everybody kind of jumps in on it as you start breaking those, you know, those major areas.
these new coins, man, I'm telling you, there was this, the other one that I said, Tao and Tia, right? Uh, yeah. I looked at that. I literally just saw people talking about this on uh, X a couple weeks ago, maybe a week ago. I don't know, because there's only a four hour chart. It was maybe in here. And I, w- I was like, yeah, it'll retest uh, 290. And I bid 290 here. And it went all the way to 740 and I never filled anything. So <laughs> like, you know, kind of the same idea there. Yep. It just never came back. I don't remember. I was bidding in this area looking for the retrace. I was like, it'll obviously retest this. No, yeah. But, yeah. But, you know, so I completely missed that. I could have just market bought and ridden that to seven bucks. What are you yeah, well, and, and that being said, you know, I want to point out that usually the retest happens. Um, so if you took a position that uh, you, you, if your trading plan was like, listen, um, I'm always going to wait for the pullback. I think you'll end up being um, more, um, more successful than if you're always looking for it just to break out and continue up. Um, you know, a lot enough times it does break out as we're seeing here and it continues. It doesn't get the retest, but um, I think the, the, ex- I think that's more the, still the exception more than the rule. And so, you know, you can't feel bad if you're kind of looking at, Oh my gosh, I'm waiting for it to pull back and it didn't pull back. Yeah. I, I think more times I, than not, it's going to pull back, but yeah, and, it's just uh, part of trading, right? What's the the meme that got with the tattoo? No, re, no, regret, no regrets, or no yeah, regrets, or whatever he spells it. No, <laughs> no regrets, man. I love it, man. Everybody follow TX West Capital on Twitter, X, Twitter, X, X, the X, formerly whatever known called. as the Twitter, <laughs> whatever the hell we're calling these is. I I just saw you're going to be on Spaces with me in 15 minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to run it back, guys. We're gonna come over to Spaces. We're going to run it back in 15 minutes. Talk more deeply about what's going on in the market and cover a bit more news. This is the kind of content I love, guys. I'm just saying, you like to have Mike come on and completely break it down with that much alpha and then to be able to switch over and look at the charts and get a really agnostic view of what the market's doing without the emotion. And uh, it, I mean, listen, that, that this is the content that we uh, definitely, uh, I love making here. I know it's not, we didn't tell you what's going to 100X next and I didn't scream at you in the thumbnail. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get the people here to hear this. Thank you, Chris, uh, very you much. I will see everybody tomorrow. Tomorrow I've got uh, Matt Hogan from Bitwise uh, and he's actually kind of convinced me that there's a more than 10% chance that the ETF does not necessarily happen by January 10th. And he's pretty <laughs> deep in it. Not because he doesn't think it will eventually get approved because there's a technicality that literally nobody's talking about that could kick the can pretty far down the road very easily at the SEC. We'll talk about that Good tomorrow. Work. Chris, thank you so much, man. <laughs> uh, see you in 15. Bye, guys. That's dope.